Hello everyone, and welcome back to my channel. My name is Dr. Steven Roth, and I'm a board-certified oral and maxillofacial pathologist. And today is my latest installment in my ultimate review video series, where we'll be talking about adonogenic cysts and tumors. Now this video won't highlight all of the adonogenic cysts and tumors that exist, but will highlight the most common and the most discussed or tested lesions of odontogenic origin. It's going to be case-based, so it's going to include both clinical and or radiographic images, as well as live histology for each example. But first, we have to get into that disclaimer, and that is that all of the opinions expressed in this video are mine and mine alone, and do not represent any organization that may employ me or that I may belong to, and that this video is for educational purposes only, and should not be taken as medical advice. Should you have any questions about your oral or systemic health care, please see your nearest oral or systemic health care provider. And with that being said, I'll turn it over to the video. Today we're going to be looking at a few adonogenic cysts and tumors, starting with the cysts first and then moving to the tumors. These are a select handful of the more common adonogenic cysts and tumors and the cysts and tumors with distinct histology. It will be case-based, so each of these represents a unique case with histology to match. The inflammatory cyst and dentigerous cyst have already been reviewed in a prior video, so I'll be focusing on different adonogenic cysts and tumors. The, the vast majority will be live. I am at the microscope and I'll be showing you the specific slides for the case. However, some cases I couldn't find the slides or the slides were in poor condition. So, so I'll be using photo micrographs to aid in our discussion. So this is our first case. It is a man in his early 50s and you can appreciate on this periapical radiograph that there is a lucency between the mandibular canine and the first premolar. This is a lower power image of the histology and you can appreciate that the epithelial lining of the cyst is varied throughout. So we have some areas where the lining is very thin and where we have thicker plaque-like changes and a higher power, we can appreciate that those thicker plaque-like changes kind of have a little world epithelial pattern to it. This histology and this clinical appearance are pretty classic for the lateral periodontal cyst. And we believe that the lateral periodontal cyst probably arises from intrabony dental lamina rests. And that's the epithelium that pinches off during development to create our teeth. Some of those get left behind in our periodontal ligament and just exist as little rests for the remainder of our life. However, in some patients, for some reason, they grow larger and cystify and create a lateral periodontal cyst. This case does highlight the most common area for these to occur, which is in the area of the mandibular premolars. The key here is that you have to rule out inflammatory pathology. So the way to do that is by vitality testing. So if teeth around this lucency are vital, then you can suspect a lateral periodontal cyst. If there is a non-vital tooth, then you can wonder about an inflammatory cyst that is derived from a lateral canal where the inflammation comes out the lateral canal and creates an inflammatory cyst. Fortunately, the histology of the lateral periodontal cyst is pretty specific so we can usually make a diagnosis on histology. This next case is a related case, and you can appreciate in this clinical photograph that there's kind of a blue bubble on the alveolus. Some people may think that this is a mucosal, but remember that there are no salivary gland lobules on the alveolus. There are some in the retromolar pad and the tuberosity, as well as the palate, but on the anterior alveolus, there are no minor salivary gland lobules. So a mucosal is impossible in this area, but it definitely looks similar and I can understand that rationale. It happened in a male in their late 60s, and while it eroded underlying bone, the bone was intact and there was no radiographic change. And here's the histology of this lesion at a lower power we can appreciate the surface epithelium all around the tissue here, 
But within that surface epithelium in the connective tissue, we can appreciate a epithelial line cystic space. On higher power here, we can see that the epithelium is varied in size, though certainly not at, at the level that the previous case was, but we do have some areas that are one or two cells thick. And then over here, we have maybe a little bit of a thickened plaque-like change. And the histology is usually very similar to what we just saw on the last slide. Uh, here are a few more of those epithelial thickenings and plaque-like swirls, though they are a little crushed here at the periphery. The histology here is usually very similar to the lateral periodontal cyst, and many believe that this is kind of the peripheral counterpart. This is the gingival cyst of the adult. And just like the lateral periodontal cyst was believed to be derived from the intrabony dental lamina rests, it's believed that these arise from the intragingival or intraconnective tissue lamina rests which are given the eponymous name of the rest of Saray or series. The gingival cyst of the adult likes the anterior jaw in the canine and premolar region, which was true in our case. The next case is in a man in their mid to late 40s with expansion between teeth number six and seven and you can appreciate that this has kind of a soap bubble appearance. And here is the histology that we can appreciate on a lower power, where we have kind of a multi-cystic area where there are multiple compartments of different cysts all around here. Some more cystic compartments. We can appreciate that like the lateral periodontal cyst, there are areas of thin epithelium, one cell layer thick, and then thicker plaque-like changes. When we go in to higher power here, We can see that the epithelium has kind of a respiratory look, uh, perhaps with a little bit of our, uh, here might be some cilia, going a little bit higher here. You can appreciate some cilia here. Maybe a little bit of African snouting, maybe a little bit of cilia. Definitely some cilia down here. Thick like plaque like change here. Definitely some cilia or African snouting all around here. And here in this part of the lining, We can appreciate mucus cells. So here are some mucus cells within the lining of this cyst. And if we zoom around a little bit more, some thickened areas of change. And here is a microcyst within the lining. All of these findings together give us a diagnosis of glandular odontogenic cyst. Now, Mucous cell metaplasia can be seen in your run-of-the-mill odontogenic cysts, but when you have all of these different findings together, including significant mucous cells, which we see even more mucous cells here, as well as cilia and microcysts and areas of thick and thick change, thick and thin change, that can help you reach this diagnosis. And this is a, a really good example of the histology of a glandular odontogenic cyst. The majority of glandular odontogenic cysts occur in the mandible, about 75%. And kind of the classic teaching is that they exist anterior in the jaw and cross the midline. Our case was anterior, but didn't cross the midline. Uh, but that is kind of the, the classic teaching. Certainly they don't always follow the rules, 
but that is uh, a very common finding for these glandular adonogenic cysts. Just some more histology zooming around here of the of this really nice example of a GOC or glandular adonogenic cyst. The next case is this pan in a man in his late 20s, described as a teardrop radiolucency between the incisors here, the mandibular incisors. The cone beam CT showed splaying of the teeth, which you can kind of appreciate here over time. Unfortunately, I don't have the slide in front of me, so these photo mics will have to do, but within the photo mics, we can appreciate the cystic space here. This is again, another adonogenic cyst. And all of this purple that you see is calcification. This is calcification within the lining of the cyst. On higher power, we can appreciate these kind of pink swirls, uh, maybe these, these pink cells that look like there should be a nucleus inside of them. These are called ghost cells. Uh, these, these little round pink cell-like structures that look like they should have a nucleus, but don't. These are called ghost cells because they have no nucleus and therefore aren't alive and they look like they should be a cell. So they've been given the cute name of ghost cells. Here's a closer look of these ghost cells in addition to the cyst lining and the calcified material. This is an example of the calcifying adonogenic cyst, which is given the eponymous name Gorlin cyst. Remember that Gorlin cysts are not a component of Gorlin syndrome, but are uh, named after the same person. This is a, a somewhat controversial lesion and they're given, it's given a lot of different names in the literature and we're not sure if this is truly a cyst or if it's a tumor. This has been called calcifying adonogenic cyst or calcifying cystic adonogenic tumor, sometimes called ghost cell adonogenic tumor or ghost cell adonogenic cyst. It can have calcifications in it. So when it does, we may call it a dentinogenic ghost cell adonogenic tumor. And these different subtypes have different studied recurrences. So the calcifying adonogenic cyst or the calcifying cystic adonogenic tumor that is more cystic in nature and doesn't have any calcified structures in it like dentin have a pretty low recurrence rate of about 5% where the dentinogenic ghost cell tumor is a little bit more aggressive and recurs about 73% of the time when enucleated as opposed to when a resection occurs then it recurs one third of the time, which is still pretty significant. Clinically, about uh, half of them will have radio opacities. And this lesion likes to be associated with other adonogenic lesions. So 30% of these occur with an impaction, 20% occur in the setting of an odontoma. Our last adonogenic cyst uh, is kind of the, the maybe most famed of, of the adonogenic developmental cysts, and that is the adonogenic keratocyst. It is relatively common. We, we do see this with, with some frequency, and it can be locally aggressive. The kind of classic finding is that it doesn't like to expand bone, but it will travel anterior posteriorly within the bone. It's also a great mimicker. So this might be associated with the crown of an impacted tooth and look like a dentigerous cyst. This could be associated with the apex of a tooth and look like a periapical inflammatory cyst, or it might be between teeth, similar to that of a lateral periodontal cyst, which is why histologic evaluation of any radiolucency of the jaw is so important. This lesion, if not treated correctly, will recur with a high frequency. As I've discussed before in my Macho Mocha video, this is controversial as to whether or not it is a cyst or a tumor. Our current belief is that it is a cyst and this case will kind of explain why that is. It is associated with a specific gene. The majority, about 60%, are associated with the patch PTCH gene, which is why this has been previously called the keratinizing adonogenic tumor. 
The posterior mandible, as in this case, is the most common site, although after the age of 60 years old, the anterior maxilla becomes the favored position. Recurrence can be between up to between 40 to 50%, which is why these absolutely need to be followed annually for at least seven years. That's kind of the common teaching for treatment of these lesions. And unlike the Gorlin cyst, the adonogenic keratocyst cyst is a component of nevoid basal cell carcinoma syndrome, which is the eponymous Gorlin syndrome. For a review of that syndrome, you can check out my video. I did do a syndrome series video on Gorlin syndrome or nevoid basal cell carcinoma syndrome, and you should check that out to get a deeper dive into that syndrome. Now, this is a pretty cool case series I have for you. This pan right here was the initial presentation at the time of biopsy, where you can see that suture tied to the first molar on the right is a decompression tube. So this was opened up in May, and it was left open to the oral environment. The biopsy at this time looks like this. Classic adonogenic keratocyst features, which we say is a cyst with uniform lining, about six, four to six cell layers thick, though I have to admit I've never really counted, with kind of a corrugated surface which you can appreciate here. It's kind of uh, similar to that of a, a corrugated box, cardboard box, where it's kind of a bumpy surface here. We can appreciate uniform thickness. I apologize for the folds here. Uniform thickness. And then the classic feature is this basal layer with palisading. Palisading means that the cells all line up similar to that of a picket fence. You can appreciate that here as well. The basal layer or bottom layer lines up like a picket fence. And again, here's a, a lower power zoom around. You can appreciate that it is consistent in size. Here's a little bit more of our corrugation here. Where it is corrugated similar to that of a corrugated cardboard box where it's kind of lumpy bumpy, four to six cell layers thick, uniform thickness with a palisaded basal layer. Now again, here is our panoramic radiograph from May at the time of biopsy. Here's a sequential her, uh, radiograph here from June and follow-up was done to make sure that the decompression tube was still working. And then finally, August, where it seems like we've reached maximum decompression. Now, a tumor, when exposed to the oral environment, should continue to grow independently no matter what. But a cyst can be shrunk with inflammation, which is the whole point of a decompression tube. It allows the cyst to become inflamed, and it will shrink with time and allow for new bone deposition. This is our final cyst treatment, which was done in the operating room, which included a nucleation with uh, either, I believe it was carnoid solution or 5-fluorouracil, which is a chemotherapy agent. And this is the same patient. This is the same cyst. And you might be asking, why does it look different, right? We've lost our characteristics. Now here, maybe we have a hint of the old cyst in this area here, but over here, it's just epithelium. This looks like kind of any run of the mill cyst that we see in the jaw. And that is because this successfully went under, uh, underwent decompression. We can appreciate that in the cyst lining, we have inflammation. And because there was inflammation within the cyst, the cyst lining converted to a more normal clinical epithelium. It became thicker and it shrunk uh, allowing for easier removal. Here's more of this inflamed cyst where we lose our classic OKC features because of this inflammation.
which is why on biopsy, a surgeon might get a diagnosis of OKC, a donogenic keratocyst, but on definitive resection, it's harder to say, you know, this probably was an OKC at one point, but we're not getting those specific histologic features. So that ends our discussion on adonogenic cysts. We're now going into adonogenic tumors, starting with the epithelial adonogenic tumors. And we'll start with the most common. This is a man in his early 70s. And you can appreciate that it is an enlarging mass that is displacing these teeth here with buccal and lingual expansion. It has been slow growing over time, but you can definitely appreciate that there is a mass there. Here we have some select cone beam CT imaging where you can appreciate kind of a more soap bubble scalloping of this lesion within the mandible, as well as moving the teeth, which is slow growth over time. It's kind of pushing the teeth apart. And here is our histology. If you remember my video on ameloblastoma, my ultimate ameloblastoma review video, I definitely recommend checking that out. I go into greater detail about this lesion, but here we've got classic follicular pattern of an ameloblastoma. Photo mics from this case are, are what I actually used in that video. And here you can appreciate these different islands with epithelium around the outside that we'll take a closer look at. But within it, we've got this kind of spider webby looking material, very similar to that of the stellate reticulum of a developing tooth bud. Here's some more of that spider webby looking stellate reticulum material within the center of these tumor islands. We can also appreciate, especially here, around the basal layer, we have hyalinization, where we have a more compressed pink area around the basal cells. When we go in to look at these basal cells, we can appreciate the reverse polarity. This kind of looks like piano keys, right? Where we have our white towards the outside and our blue towards the middle. This is because ameloblasts lay down dentin from the inside out, so in kind of a reverse way where it moves opposite of the deposition of dentin, which is why we have reverse polarity of these ameloblasts, where the nucleus is at the pole away from the basement membrane. That's reverse polarity. Now, ameloblastomas are the most common adonogenic neoplasm, but they are still pretty rare. They're only about 0.2% of the cases in a oral biopsy service. So we don't see them very commonly, um, but of the adonogenic tumors we'll be going over, it is the most common. The vast majority, 80 to 85% occur in the mandible. Though when they do occur in the maxilla, they are more aggressive. And that's because in the maxilla, the bone is more cancellous and it has more space that allows this tumor to grow. If this is treated by curatage alone, just scooping out the lesion, there is a recurrence rate uh, anywhere between 50 to 90%. So marginal resection is the treatment of choice. And there's still about a 15% recurrence rate for these, this entity. There is a malignant counterpart for this called the ameloblastic carcinoma, but that is exceedingly rare. And we're gonna see the signs of malignancy, including necrosis, high mitotic rate, uh, invasion into areas where it shouldn't be, uh, perineural invasion, and so on and so forth. This case is a female in her early teens. And you can appreciate from this cone beam reconstruction that we have uh, an impacted tooth here. It looks like perhaps an impacted canine. And you can notice that one of the kind of features that's suspicious for this as opposed to a dentigera cyst is that the cyst lining does not stop at the crown, at the CEJ. 
Instead, it goes all the way down to the root of the tooth. And while it's not necessarily a specific or sensitive finding, it can kind of uh, alert some alarm bells that perhaps this is this specific tumor. And here is a low power view of this tumor. You can appreciate at low power, we have these kind of pretty discreet blue balls, these blue circular swirls that are relatively discreet. We also have those purple flecks or calcifications, which are sometimes seen in this lesion. Zooming around here at lower power, where you can appreciate just these this mass of blue circular balls, as well as our scattered calcifications. If we go into higher power, we can appreciate these duct-like spaces right here. These are forming duct-like spaces. Now, these aren't true ducts, but rather they are probably remnants of a secretory system because adonogenic epithelium is producing adonogenic material. And so the these are likely secretory cells that are creating duct-like spaces. But because we have these duct-like spaces in the middle of these swirly-whirly balls of adonogenic epithelium, uh, this has been given the name adenomatoid, which means gland-like adonogenic tumor. It's not truly a gland, but it has these duct-like spaces, making it look similar to that of a gland, and that's where it gets its name. The features of this case are, are pretty classic for this lesion. We call it kind of the three-fourths lesion, and that's because three-fourths of patients are younger than 20 years old, just like this case. Three-fourths occur in the anterior jaw, just like this case, and three-fourths are associated with an impacted tooth, just like this case. The maxillary canine is the most common impacted tooth associated with an AOT. Half of AOTs do occur in the maxilla and half of them occur in females. So when we have an impacted canine in, let's say a, a 12, 13, 14 year old girl in the maxilla, we kind of get our hopes up that maybe we're gonna see something uh, exciting like an AOT. This by the way, has uh, an excellent prognosis after excision of the tumor. Uh, usually there is little to no recurrence, although always wanna follow these patients. Here's an intra-op photograph where you can see the very thin bone because of the tumor pressing against it. You can see the, the tumor through the osteotomy here once the flap has been laid. And here's our post-op x-ray. The uh, tumor was fully excised and uh, the tooth that was impacted was taken with it. Now, I do wanna warn you that this next case is kind of a zebra. Uh, a lot of people that are familiar with adonogenic neoplasms like to talk about this because it has a famous eponymous name, um, but it is not common, not common at all. Probably one of the more rare adonogenic epithelial neoplasms. We do not see it very often. In fact, this case represents the only one I have seen in my five years in the profession through our service. Uh, I've seen plenty in study sets but this is the only one that I've seen kind of in the wild, if you will. It occurred in a female in their late 50s, and it was described as a cyst between the roots of vital 28 and 29 without expansion and pain. And here is the panoramic radiograph, and you can appreciate that lucency between those premolars. And here is our histology. At a low power, we can appreciate these kind of thin strand-like pink cells, as well as kind of an amorphous pink material between them. Zooming around a little bit, we have a calcification here. And one of the more classic calcifications here, sometimes they'll talk about Lisa gang rings, which are kind of concentric circles of calcification within this lesion.
on higher power, this is kind of our classic finding for this tumor. This amorphous material that kind of looks like amyloid. We call this uh, ODAM, O-D-A-M, adonogenic amyloid-like material. And in fact, if we stained this with Congo red, which is an amyloid stain, it will be positive. It will look apple green under polarized light. These more cuboidal pink-like cells are similar to that of the stratum intermedium of the developing tooth. Let's see if we can find another area. Some more. Here we've got that amorphous pink-like material as well as these more cuboidal pink-like cells. These cuboidal pink-like cells, in addition to this amorphous material, and then if we have those calcifications, those lesagang rings, which we may see, uh, if there are enough of them, we may see a mixed radiolucency, radiopacity clinically. This is a calcifying epithelial adonogenic tumor, which has the eponymous name of Pinborg tumor. Again, I can't emphasize this enough. This is not a common entity. It is not common at all. So it should not be at the top of your differential, but it definitely exists, just like zebras exist. And this is a, a pretty good example of the histology. We've got this amyloid-like material, as well as these more cuboidal, pink, adonogenic epithelial cells, similar to that of the stratum uh, intermedium in a developing tooth. Half of these are associated with an impaction, but just as this case, they don't have to. Our last case of adonogenic epithelial lesions is actually a malignant lesion. This is the clear cell adonogenic carcinoma. This case is uh, a female in her early 70s with obviously a multilocular lucency. There was some expansion and you can see that it's kind of chewing up the bone, has kind of ratty borders here. On histology, we see these streaming cells here that are kind of in cords and nests. I'm gonna go in higher power. Again, we have this adonogenic epithelium that's kind of all over the slide here. Zooming around. We go into higher power. I do apologize that the slide is a little faded. This is an older case. These uh, do not happen very often. You can appreciate here on, on very high power that these cells are clear. These are clear cells. And that's how this carcinoma gets its name, clear cell adonogenic carcinoma. These clear cells in these kind of cords and nests are the classic finding. Here we've got a, a mitotic figure, it appears. Maybe some uh, mitotic figures over here as well. The majority of these, 80%, occur in the mandible, and it may or may not have symptoms, including pain, paresthesia, and swelling. Uh, pain and paresthesia usually are occur when they involve the inferior alveolar nerve. And swelling may occur, but about 60% have perforated the bone and are already in the soft tissues, leading to soft tissue involvement. These can be pretty aggressive with very involved local regional tissue involvement. Although they don't necessarily like to metastasize, regional lymph node mets only occur in about 20 to 25% of cases and distant mets usually to the lungs have been described but certainly are not common. This is more of a locally aggressive lesion, the clear cell adonogenic carcinoma. The Ewing sarcoma gene has been described uh, in the translocation for this entity. In fact, this lesion was EWSR positive on fish. It was translocated in this specific carcinoma. 
And that's a, a relatively sensitive and specific test to run on this entity. The controversy here is, is this the same entity as the hyalinizing clear cell carcinoma of salivary glands? We do know that we can get salivary metaplasia within the jaws. You can get uh, intraosseous mucoepidermoid carcinoma. So is this kind of the jaw counterpart or is this unique? Uh, and I don't really have strong feelings either way. Um, it is an entity, usually if it's confined within the bone or it, it's centered within the bone, we'll call it clear cell adenogenic carcinoma, as opposed to if it's centered in the soft tissues, then maybe we'll think about the salivary origin both of which can have the same translocation. So that doesn't necessarily help distinguish one from the other. Moving on to our donogenic mesenchymal neoplasms. This first case also might look familiar because it was used in my macho slash mocha video. Uh, this is a case of a donogenic myxoma. This is in a uh, early second decade female of uh, African descent. This was a charitable case. This young girl lived uh, in Africa and she was so ashamed of the way that she looked. You can appreciate she's wearing this scarf here uh, and she would use the scarf to cover her face to hide this, this massive tumor. I uh, still have the, the eyes blocked. This was taken from a news website because the surgery uh, gained national attention. It was a, a charitable case and it, it was given national recognition because the surgeons in my hospital system um, did this for this patient uh, as part of charitable outreach. The interesting thing about this case is it actually was reported incorrectly. Uh, it was reported that this was an ameloblastoma and that was not the case. We, we kind of expected that perhaps this would be an ameloblastoma um, since that is certainly the most common adonogenic neoplasm. That was the, the understanding at the time. This was before my time uh, in residency. I, I was not yet uh, in residency, but it happened right before I came. And obviously a biopsy wasn't done, but they knew it was a tumor and they knew they had to resect it. Uh, so resection was performed. Here is the uh, CT reconfiguration of this 3D reconstruction of this patient, you can see that her molars have been pushed to the contralateral side, as well as splaying of the maxillary tooth, teeth due to the slow growing, but really sizable tumor mass. Um, I have no clue how this young girl was able to breathe, let alone eat. But you can assume that this probably is benign since the maxillary teeth are splayed, which shows that it has moved slowly over time, similar to that of braces. And here's the tumor resection specimen. It was 861.6 grams, which is about 1.89 pounds, almost two pounds of extra weight that this poor girl was uh, carrying with her. And here's the histology on, on low power. It's very boring, very, very boring, very bland. We do have our spicules of native bone that is not tumoral bone, that is native bone that the tumor, which is this kind of clearer, more white stuff, has found its way between. And this is a very matrix-heavy neoplasm, uh, hyaluronic acid, chondroitin sulfate, and that's what makes it kind of tenacious, is that it's able to squeeze between the trabecula of bone. On very high power, it's just kind of these bland, boring, spindly-like cells. This is an older slide, so it's lost some of its blue, uh, but this is usually a little bit more blue-white, and this is the adonogenic myxoma. Very bland, very spindly, very spaced out. You do have to be careful because there is a little bit of histologic overlap between this entity and a immature dentigerous cyst. And in fact, we had a case at our hospital that was called dentigerous cyst, or rather it was called myxoma. And the child was, undergone, was going to undergo a resection, but because we reviewed the slide in our institution, we were able to correctly diagnose it as a dentigerous cyst rather than a myxoma, saving the child from a really pretty harsh resection. It can be difficult sometimes to make that diagnosis, but uh, we're gonna be able to see that 
neoplasm kind of squeezing between bones, squeezing around teeth. Um, it's going to look a little bit more diffuse than a dentator assist, which may have the epithelial lining with it. A trained oral pathologist will be able to differentiate between a myxoma and a dentigerous cyst. But this is uh, myxoma histology. It is a little bit of an older slide, which is why it's a little bit faded, but uh, I think you can still appreciate that it's a kind of bland, boring spindle cell neoplasm. Here's some nerve. It's even kind of tracking up to and around the nerve. Here is the post-op reconstruction of this patient. This case is that of a young man in their early second decade. And you can appreciate that there appears to be something around the distal root of that first molar there. The axial section of the CT makes that a little bit more obvious. Unfortunately, uh, I don't have the slide for this case anymore. So I am using this representation from the literature. This was a cementoblastoma with the very classic kind of findings. 80% of cementoblastomas occur in the uh, mandibular molar slash premolar area with half of them occurring with the mandibular first molar. The patients just like in this case are usually young, uh, you know, less than 25 years old and 75% of them are less than 30. And half are symptomatic. They are expansile and, and may cause pain because of that expansion. Histology is pretty boring. Uh, we do have this, this cemental mass here with cementoblasts that line it. This is very similar to an osteoblastoma, but you must have intimate association with a tooth root in order to diagnose it as cementoblastoma. There's a lot of histologic overlap between an osteoblastoma and a cementoblastoma, but if it is intimately associated with the dentin of the tooth root and there is no periodontal ligament, then we call it cementoblastoma. This is usually treated with surgical resection, uh, which has very, very low recurrence. And root amputation has been described, but I think uh, root amputations are being done less and less, and it still makes for a difficult procedure. And finally, we're going to talk about our mixed epithelial and mesenchymal adenogenic lesions. There's quite a bit of overlap between them. Uh, so I'll probably lump them together. Um, this first case here is a three-year-old male with a mass in the anterior mandible, which you can appreciate here. And the second case is a seven-year-old male with an expansile asymptomatic lesion of the right mandible, and you can appreciate little specks of uh, calcifications within it. Both of these lesions, uh, the ameloblastic fibroma and the ameloblastic fibroodontoma have quite a bit of overlap. They both occur in younger patients, just as these two cases did in the first two decades of life. The posterior mandible is by far and away the most common with 70% occurring there. These are very low recurrence potential. Literature suggests anywhere between zero and 20% and are usually treated with aggressive curatage, which is sufficient. There's quite a bit of controversy around these lesions, whether or not the ameloblastic fibroma is a neoplasm and ameloblastic fibroodontoma is a hamartoma or ameloblastic fibroodontoma represents a forming odontoma or a quote, soft odontoma that hasn't had time to calcify. Um, you know, I, I just know what the histology looks like. So I just call it like I see it. Uh, it's kind of an academic discussion as to whether or not it's a neoplasm or it is a hamartoma. Either way, it, it should be treated and it should be uh, removed with aggressive curatage. And here we have uh, an example of one of the entities. This has a very blue mixoid, uh, premature pulp-like background. So the pulp of a developing tooth looks this kind of blue spindly. That's our mesenchymal component. But we also have these thin strands of purple cells that on higher power look like little tiny baby ameloblastomas. 
where they have kind of a, a hint of reverse polarity here, as well as hyalinization around it, just like the ameloblastoma did. Maybe a hint of central stellate reticulum-like change, but these cords of ameloblastic adonogenic epithelium in this spindly mesenchymal background is really good for these two lesions. And if we don't see calcification, it's ameloblastic fibroma, but it's important that we zoom around, that we look at the whole lesion to make sure that there isn't calcification. So that's what we're doing now. We're getting a, a look at this whole lesion, zooming around, more of this blue myxoid background and these little tiny epithelial islands. And in here, we have our calcification. This more dense pink-like material uh, we'll call dentinoid. It's, it's kind of similar to that of dentin, this calcified material. So sometimes you'll see these being called ameloblastic fibrodentinoma if it's just the dentin. Although sometimes you can see like really well-developed odontomas within this ameloblastic fibroma. The uh, amount of calcification varies. Some of these are very highly calcified. I'll throw up a uh, picture here from a former case of ours that was mostly calcification. That's actually corresponding to the case with the panoramic radiograph that you saw. And some like this case uh, have very small amounts of, of calcification. Here's a, a little bit more here. You can appreciate maybe uh, a little bit of enamel matrix-like uh, calcifications here in the background of this dense pink kind of dentin-like material, maybe a little bit of sclero sclerosis here. Here's some more calcification of dentinoid. So you may see this as ameloblastic fibrodentinoma, ameloblastic fibroodontoma. Uh, it has different names, but the histology between ameloblastic fibroma and ameloblastic fibroodontoma or dentinoma is exactly the same, except the odontoma slash dentinoma, ameloblastic fibroodontoma dentinoma, will have the calcification. So you do want to look at the clinical. Um, you'll you'll see calcification usually in ameloblastic fibroodontoma slash dentinoma. An ameloblastic fibroma uh, won't have that calcification. And finally we will finish with uh, something that a lot of people consider to be a hamartoma, and that is the odontoma. Hamartoma means that it is substance or material that we expect in that site. However, it is disorganized. And odontomas come in two different flavors. Here is the first flavor. This is gross examination of a compound odontoma which are little tiny toothlets. And we can actually appreciate that under the microscope. Here is a low power view of an odontoma submitted for processing, where we have kind of this dentin-like structure, as well as this purple enamel matrix around the outside that looks kind of fish scaly in nature. This is what a normal tooth would look like on, in development if it was sectioned, but it's kind of abnormally shaped in addition to it's a bunch of these little tiny toothlets, kind of all over the place. Like this, this right here definitely has an abnormal shape uh, that we wouldn't expect to see, kind of malformed little toothlets all over the place. This is a compound odontoma. Compound has two O's, so that's how you can remember it. There's two O's in tooth, so compound is little toothlets. Uh, these also clinically look like they're little tiny teeth uh, all together in one area, which I've heard described as tooth jail or being in a compound. So that's another way that you can think about it clinically. The kind of other flavor of odontoma is the complex odontoma, which you can see in this panoramic radiograph here, which is a calcified mass of tooth material. 
and it's not going to look organized like the last case did. It's going to look more like a, a conglomeration of dentin and enamel matrix. And I don't have a really good slide to uh, to show that, but know that it is a, a more calcified mass. The compound odontoma likes to occur in the anterior maxilla, and it may uh, impact canines that are trying to enter the, uh, the arch. And complex odontomas usually occur in the posterior maxilla or mandible. And this is a, a more localized case. And here is a case that I actually came across in our clinic that is definitely a little bit more impressive. This has been in the patient's jaw for 45 years uh, and nothing's been done and, and nothing will continue to be done. It, it's gonna be monitored. Hopefully the patient doesn't have a pathologic fracture, but this is a, a kind of whopping complex odontoma. There are certainly other odontogenic lesions that I haven't discussed uh, that are a little bit less common, including the malignant version of the myeloblastic fibroma, which is called myeloblastic fibrosarcoma. We haven't talked about the primordial odontogenic tumor, which is exceedingly rare. And there are, uh, we didn't talk about odontogenic fibroma, but these are kind of the highlights of the odontogenic neoplasms and cysts that like to show up on exams, uh, and like to show up in the real world as well. These are all cases that I have come across and uh, am happy to share with you. Thanks for making it all the way through. Uh, since you have, have made it all the way through, please do me a favor and, and give this video a like and share it with someone else that might find it helpful as well. If you did like this format of video, I do know that it is a little bit different than my other videos. I am happy to incorporate more histology if that is something that you're interested in. If it is, just leave me a comment down below. Uh, and so I know your feedback is, is really helpful as I continue to make videos for you, the audience. Thanks again for watching and be well.